the church family relationship, when it's done properly, can be incredibly enriching. Christians who have a really strong relationship with their church, that church becomes like a lifeline for them. It's not just something that they walk into and then walk out of. I mean, it is where they go to refuel. It's where they go to mend if something has been uh, coming against them throughout the week or really at any time. I suppose I just want to sort of make a promise up front that if you are intentional with this relationship, there's so much to be gleaned from it. Hello and welcome back to the Inner Fire Podcast. We're glad you're with us today. This is part two of our two-part series on church. Last time we were talking about why you should go to church. And today we're talking about what you should do once you are at church, what your relationships with your fellow church members should look like, what engagement looks like in the weekend services and outside of the weekend services. So welcome back. It's going to be a good going to be a good discussion. You know, church is one of those things that many of us have been doing for many years, but the question is, have we been doing it correctly? Yeah. Is our view of church correct? And what I would just challenge people with going into this is that most likely you have some views that are not correct, mm. or at least how you're acting. Maybe you haven't actually thought about the views and the things that we're going to talk about. Maybe you haven't, haven't thought about them, but you may have a view of it, but you may not be doing it. And so we want to talk about some of those things today and hopefully challenge people to not make church just, you know, a stepping stone to Sunday lunch, right? right. <laughs> I mean, unfortunately, you know, I think too many of us sit in church and dream about, uh, you know, that the, the fajitas that we're going to eat <laughs> afterwards or, you know, whatever it is that's on, right. on the menu. Uh, church should definitely be a lot more than that. So uh, let's dive in. Right. And let me just say up front that the church family relationship, when it's done properly, can be incredibly enriching in a Christian's life. Christians who have a really strong relationship with their church, that church becomes like a lifeline for them. It's not just something that they walk into and then walk out of. I mean, it is it's their tribe, you know, it's their camp. It's where they, um, it's where they go to refuel. It's where they go to mend. If something has been, uh, coming against them throughout the week or really at any time. So I suppose I just want to sort of make a promise up front that if you are intentional with this relationship, there's so much to be gleaned from it. Well, there's a reason we call it church family. I mean, it should be like family. And we're going to talk about here, you know, actually it should possibly even exceed our blood family relationships, depending on what those blood family relationships are. Right. And so if you think about what a working, productive, healthy blood family looks like, the church should replicate that. Mm -hmm. It should be all those things. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there are many in our world today that do not have an intact, close-knit family support structure. Yeah. The church has the opportunity to fill that void, to be that in the lives of, of people who need it. And for those of us who do have strong blood relation families, it has a opportunity to grow that for us, to extend that to other people outside of our blood relatives and function in the same way. Mm -hmm. And that's what we want to, to look at. And I mean, there's some biblical imperatives here. There's some, uh, there's some scriptures that specifically talk about this. So we want to look at those and then just kind of talk about it in different ways how those relationships at church should work. Right. And I think a good place to start is right here in the Gospel of Mark. It says this, And his mother, this is speaking of Jesus, 
and his brothers came, standing outside, they sent to him and called him. This is speaking of his biological family. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. And I think what he's saying there is that spiritual kinship is stronger than uh, blood kinship. Yeah, hopefully in our blood families, we also have a spiritual kinship with them. Hopefully they are in right. in uh, they are also Christians and they're following Christ. Mm-hmm. And so it's kind of like having a double first cousin. You know, I mean, you got <laughs> you got a, a, a mama, daddy, brother, sister who are blood relatives, but they're also spiritual brothers. That should even strengthen that bond even more. But when you don't have that situation and you have, you know, blood relatives that do not know Christ, do not follow Christ, uh, then certainly the those that are our brothers and sisters in Christ, those relationships have the opportunity to exceed those of the family. Uh, you know, a couple of things that come to my mind when you read that verse, you know, one is the story of the Good Samaritan, you know, who is your neighbor? Right. Uh, you know, we tend to draw boxes around things like family and neighbors, and Jesus did not make those same distinctions. And so we need to be careful that we don't exclude people from those relationships. Uh, but specifically here, I mean, if you are in church and you have spiritual brothers and sisters, we need to think of them in the same terms that we would normally think of our blood family. Uh, you know, I think maybe different parts of the country view family a little bit different. I know I grew up in the South. The South emphasizes family a lot. I've mm-hmm. been other places where it seemed like the connections of family were a little more loose. And so I think we had to be you know, careful about just what model we put out there. We probably should stick to the biblical model rather than the Southern model or the sure. Northern model. But the point is we should share life with them. We should lean on them. They should lean on us. We should, uh, you know, ex- we should share the deeper things of life with them, not just the surface stuff that we tend to share at church. Mm-hmm. I mean, let's just get it out there now. When we go to church, we want to look like a good Christian. We want to put on that front. We are excellent at putting on a facade that looks good. You know, social media has reinforced how we handle that. We always want to put our best foot forward. But church should be where we go to meet our family. And when I come to my family, they know my weaknesses. Uh, They know my struggles. They're the ones that I go to when I say, look, I'm really having a problem here. Give Give me your thoughts. Give me your insight. Share some wisdom with me. That should be the function of the church. Our brothers and sisters at church should understand we're not perfect people. We should share our struggles with them. How else are we going to get support? If we do not do that, then we are never going to fulfill what the church has been called to be because we simply don't know one another. Right, right. You mentioned that the South is characterized by strong familial bonds. I would say the Hispanic community, the emphasis on family that they have even exceeds, you know, uh, Southerners. And I had the opportunity to attend a Hispanic church for a period of time in college. And I can say that it was different. The way that they conducted themselves, the amount of participation and just the intimacy of their times together was stronger. And, you know, some people may hear this and say, I understand that as an abstract concept, but I did I have a hard time really envisioning that in reality. And we have examples of what this looks like in Scripture, and I just want to point out a few of those real quick. There are some passages at the beginning and the end of the epistles that I think generally we gloss over because they seem only to be relevant to the author and whoever he's directly speaking to, not so much to us. But I don't think that we should do that because I think that they help us to have a precedent 
for how we should feel towards each other. And you'll know what I mean in just a minute when I read these. Starting in Romans, Paul says, For I long to see you, that I may impart some spiritual gift to strengthen you, that is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. Going now to 1 Corinthians. For I do not want to see you now just in passing. I hope to spend some time with you, if the Lord permits. Now, in Philippians, he says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. And that's usually where we stop. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But he goes on to say, It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers uh, with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you with all the affection of Christ Jesus. Just a couple more here. Second Timothy. As I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. Second John, though I have much to write to you, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face so that our joy may be complete. So the question that I want to pose to our listeners is, is this what your relationships look like? Is this how you feel about your church family. Um, and I think for many of us, we view, <laughs> we view our church family as, in a lot of cases, acquaintances at most, sometimes friends, and sometimes close friends. But th- this sounds very much to me like a letter that a soldier would write home when he's on the battlefield. You know, I long to see you Uh, I want to come to you that our joy may be complete. These kind of sentiments, I think that these also should characterize our affections for each other. Yeah, for me, being a business person who has traveled a lot with my work, you know, I relate it to me going on a business, a week-long business trip. So I leave out, say, Sunday afternoon or Monday morning. I travel somewhere. I'm gone. By the time Friday rolls around, I am ready to be home. I'm ready to see my wife. I'm ready to re-engage with what's going on in the family. Mm. And, you know, a lot of us, I mean, there are midweek services in some places. Some people attend those, some don't. But if we go all week and we haven't seen our family, being our church family that I'm speaking of, it should be that same kind of a thing feeling, just like what you were describing, a longing to see one another, a longing to catch up, a longing to interact because we're getting something from that. I mean, it's a, it's a lifeline for us. I think in, instead, you know, we often think, oh, well, it's Sunday again. <laughs> right. You know, I guess I better go, uh, better go to church. I mean, hopefully people don't have that attitude, but I mean, let, again, let's be real. Some sure. people do. Sure. Uh, and so I feel that way sometimes. We all feel that way sometimes, yeah. but it, it it should not be. It should be that we have a longing to go back and reunite with our family that is church and to, and to, and to have meaningful conversations with them. I think this is where we're missing the boat. You've got to be real with people in order to develop those kind of relationships. You know, I'm in a group called C12. We've talked about it on other podcasts. We get together once a month. When we go in there, you know, my group that's at that table, you know, it, yes, it, it is confidential. We go in there and we don't have to worry about people running around and, and gossiping about what our issues are. But we sh- we're real with one another. We express what our doubts are. We express what we're struggling with. And we're able to edify and build one another up because we know those things. If we're going to church and we're just putting on a front, then how can people even pray for us? How do people know how to edify us? I mean, if you walk in and say, how are you doing? And you're like, man, life is great. They're like, 
okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we certainly then don't <laughs> want to say, well, I'm glad your life is great because mine is not great. <laughs> you <Right>. know, <laughs> I need some help. You know, I'm struggling with this. I read this passage of the Bible this week. And it's totally confusing to me. I got no idea what it's talking about. Mm-hmm. What do you think it means? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, and so having those kind of conversations are where we start developing real connection with people. Um, mm-hmm. And that's, that's what we need to do. I mean, and that's really, I think the point is we've got to develop those connections in order to get to the point where we are longing to be back there. Because if you have those kind of connections, I mean, those enrich our lives. They make our lives so much more full, so much more enjoyable. I mean, that's mm-hmm. where we get a lot of joy is in those relationships. You know, I'm I just thoughts are kind of flooding my mind as I'm talking. But, you know, joy does not come from the abundance of things that we own. Yeah. It comes through relationships. Mm-hmm. God designed us that way, and that's why he has put us together in a church body to experience the joy of the Lord together as we have a relationship one with another. Yeah, absolutely. And in my ex- experience, the times in my life when I have been the most heavenly minded, the most focused on things above rather than things below, going out into the world every day and bearing witness to the darkness that is there and fighting the spiritual war when sunday comes around i am dying to get into the church because you you begin to see that the church is a place where we share the light of christ that we have in our hearts there's a great peace and ease even relief in being with those people who are of like mind and of like heart if you don't feel the need for that in your life. If you don't feel that yearning to be with that group of people, then it might be the case that you're not spiritually minded. You're not spiritually working enough throughout the week. Well, we definitely, connection to our brothers and sisters definitely begins with connection to God, right? Right. So if we're not... If we're not spiritually minded through the week, we might miss that point. But I would say, you know, that is part of the reason that we need our brothers and sisters is because oftentimes we do drift during the week. Hmm. When we come back to church, we should have those spiritual engagements uh, that draw us back to that and that challenge us in that. Our brothers and sisters give us an opportunity to, to realign. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, the word, if you, if you look at the scriptures, the word that comes through time and time again is edification. That is what we're doing there. We get encouraged. We get built up spiritually and, and emotionally. And so when we go to church, that is really the point of it is to edify one another. And, And I think if we're drifting, then we have an opportunity to be, to be brought back in when, when we get there. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And really, the next thing we wanted to talk about here was accountability and confession, which you already alluded to the need to be vulnerable with each other to let people in. Not that long ago in my small group, someone who is not even a member of the church has just been coming to the small group whenever we meet. He expressed, guys, I know that my spiritual life is not what it needs to be. And he, you know, he had a very vulnerable moment with us. And in part, that was made possible by the trust and the safety that he felt in that space. And, you know, realizing that I I reached out to him and what I came to realize was that he did not have a strong network of uh, Christians around him. And we're working on on building that now, but if he had not opened up in that moment, then I couldn't have helped him, you know, and none of us could have. Mm-hmm. If if you want to be edified, you first have to admit that you are in need. So you have to confess, you have to allow people to hold you to a standard, um, and you have to let them know when uh, stuff is 
going on and we know that it's going on yeah we all have stuff we all have problems that we deal with and, and let's talk from a practical standpoint what this looks like because if you're just going to the the one hour or so worship service when where you have a a song service or a worship time with music and then you have a sermon if you walk into that and you walk out and go back home you're not going to get what we're talking about right now mm-hmm. that, that what we're talking about doesn't happen in that we're hopefully in a minute we'll talk about what should happen during that time because mm-hmm. that is a very important time that we should be you know heavily engaged during that time but in order to do what we're talking about at the moment you have to meet in smaller groups you, you know, call it Sunday school, call it small group, call it life group, whatever name you put on. It's a, it's a group of people getting together to discuss spiritual things. Now, you know, I've been in church all my life, and I can tell you, just because you gather with a small group of people doesn't mean you're going to get what we're talking about. Right. Because, you know, oftentimes there's a lot of churchiness in those times when we all know what the church answer is, and we're giving the church answer, but we're not going deeper. And, and here, here is my admonition or encouragement to people. Be the one who opens the door to that because it takes one person to say, hey guys, I don't understand what this is talking about. I, I, I hear what they're reading right here, but this is troubling me for this reason. Mm-hmm. Or, hey, I've really struggled this week with this, this sin. Hey, I, you know, i one day this week, I went off, and I, you know, I was extremely disrespectful to my wife or to my boss, or, you know, you know, I had a road rage. I, whatever it is, whatever failure you may have had, when you share that, it swings open the door for other people to say, you know what, I, I, I'm struggling with that too. And, and so somebody has to be bold enough to open that door. Yes. And I can tell you when you start doing this, some people are going to push back a little bit because they don't want to let you into their lives. What I would say is if you will continue to be vulnerable and to share honestly, the, a, a level of trust will be built where other people begin to open up. But somebody has to do it why not you know why shouldn't it be you you know i mean you somebody's got to do it right yeah once again not that long ago i i was having a struggle with assurance of salvation and the lord was really humbling me because up until that point in my life i had always thought of struggles with assurance of salvation as something that less mature christians experienced Mm -hmm. And here I was experiencing it myself and I was on the way with Courtney to our small group and I thought, I'm going to have to tell them about this, aren't I? And I didn't want to mm-hmm. because I was, I was embarrassed, but you know, by the Lord's grace I did. And, uh, we didn't end up talking about the, our, uh, pre-planned program that night. Usually we talk about the preceding sermon. Instead, we just talked about salvation and justification and, and, uh, and what all that means. In those moments where you know that you have something that you need help with, you need encouragement, you need counsel, but you don't want to let others in, you just have to decide what kind of, what kind of small group do I want to be in? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Do I want to be in a small group where I show up for an hour and uh, we all... Um, we all posture for each other for an hour and then I go home and maybe we can talk about something that interests us when we're not in the serious time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> or do I want to have a small group where when I go, I walk away encouraged, more capable of fighting this spiritual war and helping others to do the same, encouraging them, helping them grow stronger in uh, their own capacity to wage war spiritually. And uh, you just have to make that determination beforehand. And if you have to be the one, the first one to take that plunge, Mm -hmm. then uh, so be it. Yeah, there's, I think there's another piece to that too. And that's being willing to, willing to challenge other people. Hmm. And this is probably even more difficult than being vulnerable. But 
if you're in a small group, and I'll just use this as an example, because it's a recent example uh, from my own experience. You're in a small group, and someone says, hey, did y'all watch this particular TV show? Hmm. Okay, well, in, in, in your mind, you're thinking, I would never watch that show <clears throat> because I know the content of that show, and I don't want to expose myself to that. Okay, so here you are. You got somebody else responds, oh, yeah, I watched that. I've been looking forward to seeing that. And so you got these two people that are watching this. You are sitting there thinking, should we be watching that? Now, you have, a, you have an option here. Keep your mouth shut. Let them finish their conversation. And let's just go ahead and, and, and talk about whatever the, the topic is at night. Or you can say, guys, what are, why do y'all watch that? What are you getting from that? How is that show impacting your spiritual life? Yeah. It's not that you it's not that you speak up and say, Y'all a bunch of heathens. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I would never watch that show because I am holier than thou. Right. I mean, I think we we don't do it because we're scared that's how it's gonna come across. Mm -hmm. But we can broach the subject by saying, you know, I don't I don't watch that. I've never watched that, or you know, I'd watched it one time and it was it 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 troubled me. How do y'all feel about the content that we take in? Okay, now you've started a conversation. It doesn't have to be a, you know, a, a conversation that is an indictment. It can just be an open door to have that conversation. And I believe that's the way deeper relationships are built. And it's the way we get to spiritual things that really matter in our lives and cause us to look at how we're living. Mm -hmm. I, I can tell you, I mean, we all have blind spots and it's through those conversations where, where people challenged me on things that I felt like, you know, I had known all my life. I had done a particular way and they're like, well, the scripture says this, have you ever thought about that? Mm -hmm. And you suddenly it hits you, you know, so don't be scared to start those conversations. Right. Proverbs has a lot to say about the rebuke of a friend and how dear that is and how it is an expression of love. I would also caution people that the Bible also teaches us to take the log out of our own eye before we cast the speck out of another's eye. You know, when you do cast the log out and you go through that process, you can then see clearly, as the word says, to cast the speck. And this is probably another reason that we are not so quick to challenge others because we know that we are opening ourselves up to the same sort of challenge and perhaps we don't want that. Well, it's definitely a two-way street and we don't want that. We don't want other people in our lives telling us what to do or suggesting maybe that we're not doing something correctly or even laying on that we do have problems as we've already discussed. Yeah. But we, we have to have that vulnerability. If we really want to grow, we've got to let other people in to tell us where our, our weaknesses are. We don't want to admit those too readily, even though sometimes we know them, but we, we don't want to deal with them. Uh, but it has to be a two way street, but that's, again, that's what makes life rich. Right. You know, I, I think about a lot of these things. I relate a lot of things back to raising children and you say, well, I mean, your people at church raising kids. Well, I mean, the Bible does speak about the older, uh, the older ones, uh, training up the younger ones. And, you know, I'm, I'm talking about adults here now. I'm talking about m m from a maturity level in yeah. Christ, not just an age thing. And so when I look at my kids, if I saw my kids doing something that was harmful or, or at least not helpful, I would say, uh, Hey, Andrew, uh, what you doing there? You know, have you thought about what the outcome of this might be? Have you considered the alternatives to what you're doing? And so why wouldn't we do that? with our church folks. I mean, if we see them driving off a cliff, we need to say something. Absolutely. You know, it's not, we're not going to dictate their lives. We're not their, their end all 
disciplinarian. I mean, you know, sure. we're, we're there to help, to edify, to build up, but we have to say something when we see something we don't understand about what other people are doing. Nine times out of 10, we're going to also learn something from the exchange. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, I think that's just a helpful way to view those relationships. Yeah. You bring up the analogy of parenting. Spiritual parenthood is a precedent. We have precedent for that in Scripture. Absolutely. When you look at Paul and Timothy, for example, Paul addresses Timothy as if he were a son. And those books, First and Second Timothy, that is what they are. They're him, eg- Paul, exhorting Timothy to do uh, certain things. And what we're really talking about here is accountability. And not everyone believes in accountability. And they have their reasons, and basically the argument goes like this. In an accountability relationship, you are playing on your own pride. That is to say, you only act righteously because you do not want to experience the embarrassment of confession. So accountability makes you ashamed, and it uses the flesh rather than the spirit. And in some cases it makes, uh, it makes liars out of us because we're trying to save face. So maybe we've done something, someone asks us about it and we deny it. Right. I want to address that quickly. When accountability is done rightly, shame is not the tool that is being wielded. I think of it more as light. You're shining a light on the situation. I think we're all aware that when you speak about something, when you give it a semantic reality, so to speak, it takes on a kind of existence that is different than if you had not spoken about it. You cast it into the light. Speaking it into existence is how they say it, right? Mm -hmm. It's not that the other person is judging you. It's just that that thing that you have done is now a greater portion of your life than it was before. And you've got to deal with it. Now, how how can it be so? In accountability relationships, there has to be a lack of judgment. I would say for the benefit of our viewers, I have been in accountability relationships that have changed my life for the better. I have also been in accountability relationships that I regret to this day that did make a liar out of me. The difference between one and the other was the person, my accountability partner, the feeling that they were judging me, that they were using my vulnerability against me that they did not have my best interest at heart. The relationship has to be strong. The trust has to be there and the goodwill has to be there for it to work. And also you have to be honest. I mean, if you're, if you're not going to be honest, then, then what's the point? Well, here's what I would say, because I have experienced this firsthand. I'm not speaking theoretically here. I'm speaking from experience. When the connection between the two parties that are involved, or there could be multiple parties involved if you're in a group setting, the thing that should bind you together is love. Yes. And so when love is what's binding you together, there is no response in judgment. There is a a strong desire to help pull you out of that miry clay that you're bogged down in and to set your feet on a higher plane. That's the true desire of the other person. Uh, as soon as it becomes judgmental, you have you missed the mark. Right? I mean, that's not it. And so, we probably you know need some training on how to be accountable. But it's certainly exactly what you said. If it's in a judgmental way, you know, I mean, there are some religious. I'm gonna call. I'm gonna call it church. I'm gonna call it religious groups where you're expected to come in and lay it all out and they do judge you and they do condemn you Mm. and they do say, you need to come up to this standard. Uh, You know, I'd say that's a very legalistic approach to Christianity that is totally 
not scriptural in how all these things should work. And so that is not what we're talking about. I'll make a clear distinction. That is not what we're talking about. We're talking about coming together with people that truly love you. And we'll go back to the family relationship. Hopefully the blood family relationship is, is that way in that you're getting support that you need, not just, uh, you know, condemnation or judgment. And, you know, I would say, you know, even families, mm. this in families, it needs to work the same way because as parents, sometimes we can be content, condemning and judgmental. And it's not to say that we don't judge a rightly. It, it's not, it, I mean, we could get, I mean, we could run down a rabbit hole, I guess, on this, but there's a, there's a difference in judging from the standpoint of understanding is that a right thing to do or a wrong thing to do. We right. are to judge in that way. Right. It's a different thing to say you are a lesser Christian than I am because you do that thing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know That is not what we're talking about because we all have our weaknesses. And so hopefully when these things come out, and again, I've experienced it when people... They just acknowledge that, hey, I understand your struggle. And maybe I've been through that myself, or maybe I've seen others, and this is how they were able to overcome that. Or maybe I can give you some scriptural basis for overcoming that. But it's all in light of pulling you up to a higher plane and not pushing you down to a lower plane just because you've, you've made this admission. Right. I want to read from Galatians 6. One, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. It also says, keep watch on yourself lest you too be tempted. When we're dealing with sin, there is the potential there for temptation. So these things should not be done lightly. But the part I really want to point out is to the restoration in a spirit of gentleness that should characterize our accountability relationships well restoration is throughout the scripture i mean god is always trying to reconcile and restore relationship with the whole of human race i mean that's why jesus came and so we should be striving for that same thing amongst our church family even our blood family all the people that we know i mean that's what we should be striving for I think that's good. And I think that at this point, we should move on to a few other aspects of the familial relationship you have with your church family. One thing that should absolutely characterize familial relationships is that you're there for one another, that you care for one another. And Acts 4, 34 and 35 says this. This is speaking of the New Testament church. At the very beginning, once the Spirit was given, there was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. If your brother or sister has a need and you have the means to help them, you are absolutely obligated to do that. There should not be someone in your church who is struggling with a need that you are unwilling to meet, like I say, if you have the means. One of the things that the Lord promises us is that he will meet the basic needs of life, and the church family is one of the means through which he does that. Yeah, you know, Natalie Grant sings a song... Uh, that I like. It's called B1. And it basically is talking about it. We're, we're, we're praying for miracles to happen in people's lives. And, and the song says, hey, be one. Hmm. You know, do something. You know, st don't just pray that that person's needs are met, but get up and actually be a miracle to that person. You know, God doesn't drop manna down from heaven too often. He can, mm -hmm. uh, but what he usually does is he impresses upon his people's hearts to be the manna to other people, to yes. deliver that thing that they need right at the critical moment. And, I mean, we 
you go back and look at, listen to some of our podcasts, we've, we've heard some amazing stories about that, right? Right, right. We have the opportunity to be that, but we have to be tuned in spiritually. We have to be, uh, our hand has to be open with the things that God has given to us. And we just have to be willing to do it. I think, again, we in our own families, we do that. We help mm-hmm. one another. Why wouldn't we do that to our church family? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Courtney and I got a call from a friend last night whose uh, brother tragically committed a suicide. Mm. And this this person was trying to um, provide for her brother's funeral arrangements. And throughout the course of the conversation, we came to find out that the two of them had a, a terrible relationship. Mm-hmm. They, they, it was not a loving situation between mm-hmm. them. In fact, I think they were relatively estranged from each other. And yet, when he passed away, she felt the imperative to provide for his burial, for him to be buried in the way that he desired. If, if that is the case, and, and well, I suppose the point that I'm trying to make is that familial bond is what obligated her to that in spite of the lack of strength of their relationship and you don't have to really like the person who's sitting beside you on the pew to be there for them you know insofar as you are a family i will reiterate that obligation is there you should feel that yeah and just to be clear we're not talking about uh, being a crutch for somebody. We're not talking about taking care of people who have the ability to take care of themselves. You know, we, we could, we could have a whole podcast on that, but there are so many cases where people are just in a tight spot. You know, oftentimes people don't even ask for help because they don't want to appear to need help. There's a pride thing going on there. Mm-hmm. And, but there are many, many cases where people need help of some form that's very short term that we need to jump up and, and, and fill that gap. This is especially true with, with the widows in the church. You know, I mean, the Bible speaks specifically about the widows, the orphans, those that are in prison. You know, there are some specific areas that we need to do this on, and we need to come together with our brothers and sisters to help. Yeah, That's part of what we do. And I think this is something we miss as a church. You know, I think here in the area where we live, we have some Amish and we have some some Mennonite communities. And, you know, say what you want to about those groups. I know some of them personally. They're very loving, caring people. And the one thing that they do is they live in community and they help one another. Uh, I had a, a... a tractor part that I needed some welding done on the other day. And when I went to pick it up right by the welding shop, there was a a small Amish school and the whole community was there building it. And the guy who, whose shop I was at, he said, yeah, he said, they started that this morning. They'll be finished with it tonight. I was good because there's 20 of them. They're working on it. Mm -hmm, Right. mm -hmm. Uh, And so that was a community effort we too often don't see that same kind of hmm. uh, coming together in our more evangelical churches. It's kind of every man for himself. We tend to, to want to live independent lives, but there's so much to be gained by doing that. But yes, we do have to give up a little bit of ourselves. We need to evaluate our own busyness to see if we're too busy. And one thing I, I thought earlier you know, when, when we have the kind of relationships we've been discussing, going to church isn't a burden. When you don't have those kind of relationships, all these activities become very much burdens hmm. because there is no rich relationship there. We're just going and, and, and I, I hate to say checking a box. Maybe we are doing something good, but we don't, we're not doing it in such a way that it, it fuels our own spirit. And so having these kind of relationships makes church uh, and not a burden, I, I guess. Say. It'd be something we're looking forward to rather than something we're dreading. Right. I'm, I'm, I've had a few passages come to mind here as we've been discussing this. The Bible does say, this is speaking of those inside the church, 
that, you know, he that does not work should not eat. That is to say, the church's job, while it is to care for its members, is not to subsidize idleness. Sure. Right. We are not meant to be idle. There are many uh, passages that we could refer to on that. The Bible also says that one who does not provide for his own household is worse than an unbeliever. And if we accept, once again, the uh, familial relationship uh, that a person has with their church, you also see that uh, providing for your church family is also something that you're expected to do. So I think that we've said enough on that. Mm -hmm. I think what we should do now is get into some particulars. We've been talking generally about the relationships that we have with our church family, but let's talk about what happens at the weekend service. When you walk through those doors, what should your attitude be? What should you be doing? What should you walk away with? Let's let's start with worship. And I, I, I hate to even say that because when I say worship, what does everyone think I'm talking about? Music. music. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll just get this out of the way now. Worship is so much more than just music. I tend to use the term musical worship. And some people, they don't like the fact that worship is largely musical at church because music is one of many art forms through which we could express our worship, our praise, our adoration for God. And that is true. However, I will say that there is a special emphasis put on music and particularly singing. There's also talk of playing instruments and even of dancing in the Bible, but singing in particular is mentioned in the New Testament as being something that we ought to do when we gather. The Bible even says, exhorting one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So, with all of that said, what do you want to say about singing in church? Well, first of all, let me just acknowledge that there's a wide variety of musical styles. And if you go beyond just the music and the worship, there's a, there's a variety of styles of preaching. There's different ways that people conduct services. So we're going to try to speak about this in a way that impacts all, no matter what type of service they're in. And so, you know, the first thing I would say is church in general is not a spectator sport. You're not there to observe uh, only. You're, you're there to participate in it. And when it comes to singing, this is, you know, definitely case in point. You know, and whether we go to a contemporary church where there's a worship band and lights and fog machines and all that, or whether we're just in a in in, in a tr more traditional church where we're singing hymns or, or whatnot, it the, the the issue is the same. Is am I engaging with the music that is that is being played with the the words that are being spoken? You know, uh, Bill Gaither and and Mark Lowry years ago had this thing where you know Bill told Mark, you know, run that lyric through your head, uh, <laughs> and and. But it was a true statement. We need to think about what we're singing. So often we're just reading the words off the screen or from memorization or out of a hymn book or wherever the words are coming from, and we're not engaging with them and really worshiping God through uh, that music and through the song. And so if we want to get anything out of it, we have to come with a spirit of engagement. And this is going to go, this will be the thread throughout all of our involvement in church you know, we want we want to put the responsibility on the on the worship pastor, on the pastor himself when he preaches, who whoever's up front. We want them to bear the responsibility of us getting something out of it. Mm -hmm. But we need to take that responsibility back onto ourselves and say, hey, I can make a difference here if my heart and my attitude is right. Yeah. When you have a group of people that is really singing, and we don't see this very much anymore, but there are still places that are like this. You go in there and everyone is singing, and they are bolstered by each other's singing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I look, 
I'm a college educated musician. I'm very confident in my singing ability. Even I, last time I went to church, I was singing, but I didn't want to draw too much attention to myself. I heard someone behind me who was belting it out at the behest of the pastor who uh, specifically spoke about that last week. And then I thought, okay, I can come on a little bit. That was one person in a sea of thousands Mm -hmm. that, that caused me to feel that way just because I was within earshot of them. When we all do that together, it is so powerful. I mean, it will grip your heart to be a part of a throng like that. And it is just like a little piece of heaven. You know, it's what we imagine heaven being like. Once again, if it has to be you that starts the domino effect, (laughs) then so be it. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I believe it was, uh, I don't, I guess it was Charles Wesley that was the hymn writer. I get John and Charles confused. (laughs) There were these guidelines that they wrote about musical worship in church. And this word that was used stuck with me. The guidelines said that you should not be bawling. That is to say, (laughs) just hollering it out. That's not what we're talking about here. I would avoid doing anything that unnecessarily draws attention to yourself. And my more musical people, I think, really need to listen up here because we can sing harmony. We can do the little ad libs that the worship team is doing and and that kind of thing. And I didn't realize that people actually did that from the congregation (laughs) until I went to college. (laughs) Uh, But yeah, that that is the thing that, that people do. And I don't think that there's anything wrong with either of those. But I would try to avoid drawing attention to yourself unnecessarily just because what you're doing is meant to be corporate. This is not your time alone with God. This is not where you close your eyes, you close your ears, and it's just you and God. Even some some uh, church leaders will say that sometimes. It's like, yeah, you're, you're, you're not in the shower. You're not in your car by yourself going down the road. You're right. in a group of people, and right. it is... What you said a minute ago is us feeding off of one another in a way that is somehow deeper than what we can really understand psychologically. There's something going on there that bolsters our spirit. It joins us together in unity when we're all praising God together. It lifts us to that higher plane that I was was talking about. I just don't think we can hardly get there by ourselves. Mm -hmm. We need other people around us. And I think that's what the corporate worship does. I think I've said this before, but you know, I love it when I love our music, you know, we have a a small orchestra, all that is good stuff, but I really like it uh, at, at the end of a song. Oftentimes our worship pastor will stop the music and we'll just sing as a congregation and I'm thankful I'm in a congregation that sings. They sing out. Yes. And, I mean, it kind of just gives you chills up your spine when you hear all of God's people lifting praise mm-hmm. together in unison. I yes. mean, it's, it's really, that's what you're there for. Yeah, absolutely. And it breaks my heart that there are some people listening to this podcast that have never experienced that. That, yeah, and that I, may never experience that. Well, and I think I think what we need to address is okay. What if you're not in a church like that? Yeah. What if your neighbors won't sing? Uh, <laughs> what do you do? And I think the first thing you do is you sing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that, that's don't let their non-participation cause you to be a non-participant. I think the other thing you do is you begin to, if you develop the relationships like we talked earlier, you begin to have this conversation and say, hey. I would really love it if maybe some of y'all who do sing would come stand by me and let's, let's start this little cell that sings, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and rather than being scattered all over the church and then, Hey, you know, it's like the choir in the congregation, effect. Right. you know, Hey, come, let's, let's, let's sing together. Mm-hmm. And you know, that's something you can have a conversation about if you're being honest with people mm-hmm. and, and get them to make a joyful noise unto the Lord, which is what we're there for. Right. Yeah. I like how you mentioned the choir. That actually is one of the technical functions of a choir is to pull the rest of the congregation up into uh, the music. And of course, choirs are kind of going out of style these days. 
But those who do advocate for choirs advocate strongly because they know that we need that. You know, we don't need to let that go. Um, let me just say this. Singing is mentioned 400 times in the Bible or thereabout. And at least 50 of those are, are direct commands. Singing is important. And if listening to music is great and that can be spiritually beneficial, but regardless of your musical talent, I would encourage people to not just go and stand there and with their mouths shut. I mean, if you think that you sound awful, then maybe you can start by singing quietly or something like that. I will say in an ideal circumstance where everyone is singing, there is enough of a musical ear across the general populace Mm -hmm. that the strong voices can help the not as strong voices actually sing in tune. Mm -hmm. Um, But you know, that, that aside standing there with your arms folded, lips sealed, doing nothing, just waiting for it to be over that is not pleasing to the Lord. Well, another thing I want to hit on here too is a lot of people want to push down the emotion or minimize the emotion, but I don't see how you can have an interaction with an all-powerful God who has who has saved you from eternal damnation and brought you into relationship with him who provides for your needs, who gives you your very breath. How can you worship him without any emotion. Right. I mean, it doesn't seem practical to me. Uh, you can go through, you can sing a song without any emotion, but you can't truly worship without emotion somewhere. So don't be scared of emotion. I, you know, tears are good. I mean, uh, raising your hand. I mean, all those things are important. And I just, you know, I just believe in my soul that when we get close enough to God, it causes us emotion in some form or fashion. And we shouldn't try to eliminate that in our church services. Right. And music stirs the emotions. I thank God for the Protestant Reformation, without which our lives would be very different. However, the reformers were many of them, not so much Martin Luther. (laughs) He loved music. But some of the others were very suspicious of music and not without cause, because it can be the case that when your emotions are stirred, they're not stirred rightly. Mm -hmm. However, their answer to that issue was to take the music and make it as little like music as possible. We, they followed the command to sing, but they would have no instruments. They would sing acapella and they wouldn't sing anything that was human composed. That is to say, they would only sing psalms and canticles and Mm -hmm. whatnot. Music is not something to be held at arm's length. Like, I'm going to do the music. I just want it to not move me. That's not the answer. Allow the music to to move you. People say, focus on the lyrics. People put so much emphasis on the lyrics. Again, that's wise. However, if the lyrics were the only important thing, then we could just recite the lyrics in some kind of responsive reading or something. The music itself, even if there were no lyrics, have a role to play in bringing us, has a role to play in bringing us closer to God. Yeah, and and, and just a quick thing too, don't get so caught up in the technical aspects of the music that you lose the music. You know, mm-hmm. what's going on with the music and all that you just said, you know, uh, you know, if you're trying to sing a part or you're trying to, you know, play something without making a mistake. Don't get so focused on that. You lose the point of what the music is trying to do. Right, right. Well, we could stay there for a long time, but I think we had better move on just for the sake of time. Let's talk about the sermon for a minute. Mm -hmm. What should your approach be to the sermon? Well, obviously, you should listen intently. Some people, it helps them to take notes. I, I don't like to take notes personally. I find that while I'm taking the note, I'm missing whatever he's saying while I'm doing that. Mm -hmm. So I prefer to just listen and maybe do some reflection later on. So, I mean, that is baseline. You need to be paying attention. I would encourage people to try to avoid using their phone for Bible references. 
We all love the Bible app. It's great. But your phone is a little distraction machine. And you do not need those distractions while you're in church, um, particularly while you're trying to listen to the sermon. And uh, you risk distracting other people. I mean, when you're on your phone, the pastor can see that too. That's going to be discouraging to him um, unless you know he's aware that you're using it to do something, to read a verse, whatever. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, you should let the sermon penetrate your life. You should go in with the, the idea, what if I did exactly what he's saying right now? And then you have an image in your mind of what that would look like. And if that image in your mind is not, cannot be overlaid perfectly upon your life, then you have work to do. And a good question to ask on the way home when you're reflecting on the sermon is, what are we going to do about this? Are, this is you talking to your family, presumably. Are, are we doing what the pastor said? If not, what steps are we going to take to make that happen in our lives? Well, generally on the way home, I'm thinking, man, I hope so-and-so was here and heard that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, that was a great <laughs> sermon for old Joe over there. I hope he was taking that in. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, that that is a trap that we fall into. We, mm -hmm. we think that it was a great sermon for someone else. <laughs> right. And we fail to do exactly what you were saying, is to look in the mirror of the Word and see what it means to us. You know, we're not perfect people. We've all got room for growing. You know, I, there's a lot of different ways we could go here. You know, I know people come in and say, well, you know, you haven't heard my preacher preach. You know, it's very dry or, you know, it's very whatever. You know, I mean, there's all kinds of excuses that we could give for why we're not engaging. The truth is, if he reads a scripture passage, there's something in that passage that we need to know about and heed and so we need to do exactly what you're saying. Uh, overlay that with our own lives and, and be engaged in it and try to, to mine something out of it. You know, hopefully you have a dynamic pastor who is bringing things out and you're just sitting there like, oh, wow, oh, wow. I see how, you know, it, reality is it's not always going to be that way. And even if it is that way, you still have to see how it applies to you and what your takeaways are from that. And, you know, sometimes it's practical stuff like how you treat your wife. Uh, I hope at least sometimes it's how, what your view of God is and what your relationship of God is. Uh, so <clears throat> I think that's how we need to be engaging with the sermons. Yeah. Uh, let's just say one more thing about that. I think that it's easy to bring a critical spirit to a sermon. Mm-hmm. And insofar as you do reflect on the sermon afterwards, which I, I would hope that you would, that conversation can become, okay, what, what grade are we giving the pastor for the sermon today? You know? Yeah. What, did, was he right? Did he hit the mark? Look, we should test all things against Scripture. And pastors are fallible. We have to appeal to a higher authority than the pastor, and that authority is the Word of God. I'm not saying you should not uh, be awake to potential errors that your pastor could make. However, you are there to learn, not to critique. And just be mindful of the spirit that you're bringing to that sermon. Yeah, for sure. Uh, that is a trap that we often fall into is just critiquing style and critiquing whatever. You know, uh, we can uh, do a little... Monday morning quarterbacking, if you will, over Sunday lunch <laughs> about how I would have done that differently. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you've been in that position, which I have, and you're charged with getting up before a group of people every, every Sunday and challenging them and giving them something that they do not have, that is a, it's a tall order. It's not an easy thing to do because what a pastor is really trying to do is to get people to move from where they're at 
to somewhere different, to grow spiritually, to give them something to chew on that will move them forward. That is what the pastor is trying to do. And sometimes the reason it's so difficult is because we're so set in our ways that what he is saying is just bouncing off of us. Hmm. You know, and so we need to do a self-examination and say, is my heart open to the word? Is my heart a fertile ground? Has it been plowed before I got here through prayer and searching the scriptures on my own to be receptive? And the other thing is we need to love our pastors. You know, just like the relationship that we were talking about before, we should have that same uh, uh, view of him, obviously, right? And, and if we love our pastor, it could cause us to view the sermon a little bit different rather than just being critical of it. Yeah. Amen. Oh, yeah. Speaking of amen, I'm sure the pastor would appreciate one every now and then. I'm a little suspicious of calling out amens. <laughs> suspicious is not the right word. There, there, can be, uh, there can be issues there. You don't want the, the pastor's sermons to be colored by what he thinks the congregation is going to like more so than the the truth of the word. However, pastors need encouragement, just like we do. And a a hearty amen when he hits the nail on the head might just be the way to do that. (laughs) Well, uh, you know, not every tradition uh, is big on amening. We happen to come out of one. I've been in all different kinds of churches and seen it done different ways. But speaking from a pastor, it definitely is an encouragement. It'll, number one, it lets you know people are awake. Uh, and, and by the way, if you are snoozing in the pew, your pastor can see it. Right. And that is not very encouraging. Uh, you know, so part of this, you know, oftentimes, you know, we're talking about being real. Oftentimes we sit in the pew, and at about 11.45, if that's our time of church, we're thinking, where are we going for lunch? Uh, you know, and, and our mind can easily be diverted away by that. Sure. We've all done it. Let's be honest. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, you and I were talking before we got on the podcast. One of the things that we probably should do, just as a purely practical matter, eat before you go to church. Don't come into church hungry. Don't let your growling stomach be a dis- distraction. Now, don't load up so much that you're sitting there in a food coma <laughs> and you're just snoozing because you're so right. comfortable now. But you know, don't be, don't let that be a distraction uh, during church. I mean, if, if we're, if we're doing that, we really need to check up and say, is, is my mind in the right place? Right. Right. Yeah. Put yourself in a good position. Yes. There's nothing wrong with being hungry. Okay. We're, we're, we're human beings. Like we need food. You should anticipate that, Mm -hmm. you know? And I, I would say, you know, drink the coffee if you need to, but no one needs reminding of that. We have so much coffee at church. I think we're set there. Yep. Okay, let's move on. Let's talk about the sacraments for a minute. This is very important. Mm -hmm. Starting with baptism. Baptism is, in my mind, one of the most important things that happens on a given Sunday morning. Really, both of these sacraments are. We're talking about baptism and uh, the Lord's Supper. Baptism is one of the most joyous things that a Christian can experience from the baptistry and also from the pew. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a person who is making their public profession of faith, who is confessing with their mouth, as the Bible says, that Jesus is their Lord and Savior. I mean, if, if that does not warm your heart, if that does not put a smile on your face, then I don't I don't know what would, Mm -hmm. as with anything that is uh, meritorious of celebration, we need to gather together and celebrate it for for what it is. Do you have anything you want to say about that? Yeah, I would just say sometimes we look on baptism like we do other things. We think, well, well, okay, they got saved. They're, you know, they're coming forward and, and they're kind of checking a box, but in our world today, we, we forget the symbolism. Yeah. I mean, we, the symbolism of what's happening during a baptism is, should be so powerful. And it should be a reminder to all of us who have already been baptized that we did the same thing. We made the same commitment because what are we really saying? I am dying to myself. I am dying with Christ. I'm being raised a brand new person. My life is going to be 
different. My priorities are going to be different. My focus is going to be different. I mean, it's a huge milestone in our lives. I mean, it really cannot be understated, but so often we're just saying, oh, well, it's just, you know, it's just something everybody does, but we really need to focus in on that. And it should be a reminder to us in the pew that, hey, I am a new creature in Christ as well. Yeah. The analogy is made in scripture between the flood and baptism. When you go under the water, you leave that which is unrighteous in you to die there, to be buried there. Mm -hmm. You're dying to the flesh. And what comes back out is what is righteous. You know, the new life that you have in Christ Jesus that's a very important ritual for us to observe and for us to be able to look back on and say, I, I proclaimed this before a group of people that I was leaving my old man behind. Much like a wedding, we have people witness weddings so that they can then hold us to the commitment that we made there. Mm -hmm, and I think mm -hmm. that the baptism is similar. We need to have people there to see this proclamation that we're making and in doing so, help us to live in that. Yeah, and it's just another reason for being at church. You know, being baptized, it's hard to baptize yourself. <laughs> I'm not sure that's a thing. I mean, it is <laughs> intended to be a public profession, yeah. which means other people need to be there and witnessing it, and it is it does serve as that accountability point. Right. So let's talk about um, communion for a moment. Of course, this harkens back to the Lord's Supper, the image of consuming Christ's body and blood, I think is poorly understood. I have not really been taught the significance of that very much. What I know about it at this point, I've largely gained through my own study. Mm -hmm. But they say you are what you eat. It's technically true. The food that you eat becomes the tissue that makes up your body. So what then does it mean to eat the body and blood of Christ? You are being transformed gradually into the likeness of Christ. And uh, that requires that Christ's body be broken. We could not be like Christ unless he made the sacrifice that he did for us. And that's, that's what we're called to remember, you know, remember the sacrifice that Christ made that, that makes us possible to be like him, to be sons of God. Yeah. And in some ways, the way a lot of people do, uh, communion today, there's individual crackers and we lose the breaking of the bread, which mm -hmm. was the breaking of Christ's body. Mm -hmm. We don't emphasize that enough that he was broken for us. And, you know, when we, when we take communion, we, you know, we could get into the details of it. I, I have a lot I could say about it, but I think the point we're making here is it is something that should be done communally together with your brothers and sisters that again, strengthens us as individuals and as a body, because we're all acknowledging this together, that we are becoming one with Christ. And if I'm one with Christ and you're one with Christ, then we should be one with one another. Yeah. Right? We yeah. should be joined together in that one spirit. And so communion should create a unity amongst the body where we're all acknowledging the same thing and that we're being partakers of Christ's death on the cross, that we're being joined with his body. Uh, and, and the suffering that he endured. You know, we are called to suffering. We had, I just had a good conversation about that uh, earlier this week with a group of people, but uh, it's very interesting if you, if you look at what suffering is and what we're called to do. But nevertheless, it, communion should do that. We can't do it as effectively on our own. I agree. It's for believers only. This is a, this is a time in which it's appropriate to be exclusive. Mm -hmm. Exclusivity is like the cardinal sin of this generation's uh, mindset. I'll just say this and leave it here. You are not doing anyone a favor by allowing them to partake in communion if they do not know Christ. Amen. 
All right, let's quickly hit on a few other things. Let's talk about giving. Mm -hmm. Tithing. Um, a lot of people believe that 10% is what you are obligated to give to the church. Now, in this, you might notice in Inner Fires, uh, in our content, whenever we're telling you to do something, generally what we will bring to the table is an example in scripture where it is commanded or examples and also precedent in scripture when we've seen God's people do it before. In tithing, we have precedent, but I will say not a direct command. In spite of that, some people still believe it is that is our imperative to give 10%. I don't believe that you're ever going to go wrong by giving 10%. Well, let me say, I don't think you're ever going to go wrong by giving 10% or more. You might go wrong giving just 10. What do you want to say about that? Well, I would just ask the question, how successful do you want your church to be? Let's, be, let's face the facts. It takes money to run an organization like a church. You want a pastor that's uh, fully engaged in the work of the church, or you want a pastor who's worrying where his next meal is coming from, or how forced he's gonna, to take another job, how he's going to pay the electric bill. Yeah. You know, uh, you know. So I mean, there's that support of the staff. That's one thing, but the general work of the church. I mean, we just you read the scripture earlier. They sold all that they had and came and laid it at the disciples' feet. Why is that not the New Testament standard? Uh, you know, that's a, I think as it goes a little above 10%. I think the whole point is the money that we have has been given to us by God. And yeah, I mean, maybe you got a job, you work for it, but you know, we won't make that whole argument. It's a gift of the stuff that you have is a gift of God. And so we don't need to hold it tightly. And I think we should just look and say, what does God want me to do? It's a matter of the heart. It's not a matter of 10% or some other percentage. I don't think that should be, I mean, that, that's a starting point, yes, and there's a precedent in Scripture, but if we stop there, we miss the point of how, you know, what resources do we want the church to have? How successful do we want it to be? And it's, it's not all about money, but it, the money it plays a part that we can't get away from. So you need you need to give. You know, I think about the the, the widow's mite that she put in. Mm. She sacrificed all. Jesus made a point of uh, of acknowledging that, mm. whereas the others were putting in more for show. Right. Uh, so it takes money to run a church. We need to be participants in that. We will receive a blessing according to Scripture. By that, it's not we're not giving in order to receive. That's not the point of it, but it is something that God expects of us. Right. You can't outgive God, as the saying goes. Right. Scripture is also clear that those who bring you the word, who teach you, who admonish you, they are due their keep mm -hmm. for that work. Mm -hmm. Um. And when you give of your own hard-earned money to the church, you have a greater stake in what goes on with that church. Mm -hmm. You're more likely to get involved. You're more likely to make your voice heard in the goings-on of the church. And you're going to want to attend that business meeting on, on Wednesday night a little bit more. Yeah, let me just say, though, you're not giving your money in order to have control. Like, I, yeah. get, I give this much, therefore I'm in control. No, it's not I, a shareholder situation. Yes, <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, I, I, I give, yeah, exactly. It, it, it's not an equivalent situation as a shareholder. So we don't need to miss that. You know, we are humans, and oftentimes the people who give the most we think should have the biggest say. But if you, again, look at the, that scripture where they laid it at the, at the disciples' feet, there is a trust level involved there doesn't mean that we don't speak up or, or have our opinion heard, but it needs to be an opinion that is spiritually based, not just an, a fleshly, earthly desire for control. Right, right. And some people have a talent for handling money. Mm -hmm. Some people, are they're just better at it than others. Those people who know how to deal with money, who have a good... Uh, aptitude for business we need those people to step up in the church absolutely. and to make their talents useful absolutely let's end on this service 
there are plenty of opportunities to serve at your church. I feel confident, particularly if it has any kind of size. Now, we hit on this last time. I won't hammer it too hard here. A lot of serving that I see the church doing goes back into the church. Mm -hmm. Just as we were saying before, you know, the church takes money to run. The church takes volunteers to run. And volunteer work is the lifeblood of many churches. Should you serve your church? Absolutely, you should. And once again, I'm going to harken back to what we said last time. You may not have one of the churchy gifts, but whatever gift that you have can be used in service of the church. And some things that the church needs don't require particular talent. You don't have to be talented to mop a floor or to, uh, to dust off some furniture. And I think that those jobs while they may not be as glamorous as, you know, the worship team, those jobs are good training for us. Ministry is not glamorous. If you've ever seriously engaged in it, you know that it's, it's a kind of a messy business. And the more things that you can do outside of the view of others secretly, the less likely it is that you're going to be tempted to be prideful and the Lord rewards work that is done in secret that only he can see. And he that is least shall be the greatest. Right. So definitely we all, in our humanness, want the jobs that have the light shining on them. But that's not the greatest. Uh, it is in those things. And I think there, there's a balance between serving those in the church and serving those outside the church. You know, if you're a teacher you're teaching the church, you're training people up, you're mentoring people in the church. You know, the, as you just mentioned, there's a host of other ways you can serve the church, but there needs to be a balance in serving the church and the community because it's out in the community is where we spread the gospel and where we tell the good news to the rest of the world. And right. if we're only internally focused, I mean, we, we train up the church in order to go out, not to just then you know, train the church again. I mean, it, it's, it's it has to have an outward, bigger picture uh, view if we're going to be successful. Right, right. The Navy SEALs don't spend hours suffering on the beaches just to be tough. They spend hours suffering on the beaches so that when they can then go and accomplish the mission, mm -hmm. right, it's not for nothing that you're being discipled. You know, you're being discipled to go out and make more disciples. You know, I'm going to say another little phrase. Each one, reach one, right? Mm -hmm. you, you have a job to do. You need to pull your weight in regards to um, outreach. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think that is pretty much all of the ground that we wanted to cover today. There is... Uh, there is more that can be said, and you know, I'm having something come to mind just now. And perhaps this would have been better for last podcast, but while we're being real about the church, let's just say we get on each other's nerves. We hurt each other. We speak unkindly to each other. There's bad blood between members of the church at any given time. This is not lost on the Lord, and this is not a new problem. Mm -mm. The early church struggled with this as well. There are instructions in the Bible for how to deal with problems that you have, and not only how to deal with them, but how to deal with them uh, promptly. You know, don't leave your gift at the altar if your brother has something against you, right? Don't let the sun set on your wrath. Mm -hmm. If there's an issue, it needs to be handled. And don't just drop what you're doing and go to another church or disassociate with that person who you have a beef with without having at least gone through what the Bible says to do in those situations. And look, maybe you do all of that and the other person just doesn't budge. Uh, they don't have to apologize to you for you to forgive them. Mm -hmm. Do, do what you can and don't, don't, um, don't run when things get tough. 
Well, and all those things that you just mentioned, all should be done in love with the purpose of reconciliation and edification. If that's how we're doing it, then we will achieve the best possible result. Uh, so, yeah. you know, I would just, just summarize everything we've said today. For me, you need to be in church. We established that last week. When you're there, you need to be engaged and you need to recognize that those people are your family and you need to let every interaction you have be directed by love and edification of, of your family. If you do those things, church will not be just something where you're checking a box and saying, I, 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 I did that, I went to church, I, I did what I was supposed to do, but it will become a rich part of your life that you simply will not want to do without. Yeah. You don't get to choose the family you're born into. In the same way, you don't get to choose who the Lord saves, who he grafts into the body. It is our responsibility to love and to care, to help, to be patient with our brothers and sisters in Christ. No matter how much you do those things, you could never do them more than Christ has done for you. And I think that with that, we'll go ahead and wrap up. Thank you all so much for joining us for this episode. We hope that it's been a blessing to you. If it has, please share it with a friend. Give us a five-star rating or give us a thumbs up on YouTube, whatever the case may be. Until next time, God bless you. Thank you.